Section four, we have defined the normal distribution. We haven't done the algebra and you really don't want the algebra. You'll see it in the curriculum, just don't be frightened off by it. Um, but we've defined roughly how it looks like. We've, we've defined a couple of the key numbers, especially 1.645 and 1.96. Don't forget, I assume you now know those numbers. Uh, we're now going to start applying this to uh, all sorts of scenarios. The first one, and one of, one of the key ones is conf confidence intervals. What a confidence interval is, it's a range within which we are X percent confident, typically something like 95% confident, that something is going to fall in this range. So in a simple example, we're going to see confidence intervals really defined twice. First time is in this reading, the next time is in the next reading. So confidence interval, for 95% confidence interval, captures 95% of a distribution. So if we have a normal distribution and we go plus or minus 1.96. We already, we've already talked about this. You know that captures 95% of the distribution. So if I pick a random variable, a random number from this normally distributed uh, variable, then the chances are 0.95 that it's going to fall in our interval. Uh, and as you may imagine, the wider it is, the more, the closer to 100% it gets. It's never going to quite get to 100%, but the narrower it is, it's less confidence. We're more likely not to land in here. The wider it is, the more confident we are that our random variable will land in here. So let's do this example, or you can do this example. You can see that 90, 95, 99% is the mean plus or minus certain number of standard deviations. We saw that when we were defining the normal distribution. So as a simple example, 95% is mean plus or minus 1.96 or plus or minus two standard deviations. 99% it's mean plus or minus three standard deviations. And we know that that was an approximation for 2.58. Um, Example, a portfolio has monthly historic returns averaging 85 basis points with sample deviation 28 basis points. BP means basis points, it means 0 0.05, uh, sorry, 0 0.01%. So 85 basis points is 0.85%. We'll do that in fixed income. Um, but 20 BP means basis points. So we have this random variable, it's averaging 85, sample deviation 28. Calculate 90 and 95 confidence intervals, assuming a normal distribution. Have a go at that. So you, you've got two little graphs to scribble on. Have a go at 90 and 95. Work out what the range is. And then you're converting back to basis points. So, the, for example, the point where z equals 0, it means the historic return equals 85%, 85 basis points. Uh, where z equals 1, your return equals mean plus one standard deviation, which is 85 plus 28, which is 113 basis points. So have a go at those two, see what you make of it. Let's see what we've got. 90%, we need to take the mean plus or minus 1.645. So let's say that's minus 1.645. And let's say that's plus 1.645. This range captures 90%, and we know that, we've covered that already um, earlier. So this range captures 90%, and so it's the mean plus or minus 1.645 deviations, this is all sample statistics here, uh, equals 85 plus or minus 1.645 times 28, because that's our deviation. Uh, and so the lower end of that range is 85 minus 1.645, which is about 38.9. And the upper range is 85 plus 1.645, which is 131.1. And there's our answer. In basis points, that range captures 90% of the population. Therefore, we're 90% confident that that range is that, that, that a random month, for example, uh, will have historic returns in that interval. Uh, and that's how this works. 95%, uh, it's pretty similar, except we are much close to minus 2. Minus 1.96 to plus 1.96. Same idea, there's 95% confidence interval. Uh, that's 95%. Just to be clear, this is 90%. Uh, and so here, it's the same idea. So 95% confidence interval is mean. I'm just going to write out the answer here. 85 plus or minus 1.96 times 28. So there's our range. And that comes to 30.1 at the bottom end. 
up to 139.9. If you did it rounded, it doesn't matter. So, 100, so 30 to 140 is absolutely fine. Uh, in the exam, of course, you would look at the three answers and you will find that one is very close to where you are. Uh, and that's how we do confidence intervals. Now we're going to see confidence intervals again and to be honest the second time we see them is going to be much more useful. Uh, this you may think is useful but in fact uh, all we're doing is defining what they are. The way they're used in general is what we're going to see in the next reading. This is useful and if you're asked for a confidence interval that captures 95% of a distribution this is what you do. But that is only one question. Most times the confidence that the intervals are mentioned will use a different definition which we're going to come to. It's the same definition but it's a different distribution. Uh, you'll see what I mean when we get to the next reading. Now we talked about uh, the, that point, 85 basis points, being where z equals zero. And so we need to be able to, we need to, be able to link the 85 on the underlying distribution to the uh, n01 distribution to say that that is where z equals zero or the other way around. And so in order to do this, uh, we've got this formula here, z equals x minus mu over sigma. In all honesty, you really shouldn't need this uh, because what we want to do is to say, if we have a value, how many standard deviations is it above the mean? So the z score of a particular value is the answer to the question, how many standard deviations is that x above the mean. So above the mean, x minus mu, how many standard deviations is that? x minus mu divided by sigma. So I really hope this is fairly obvious. So we can use that formula or not as we may like. So the uh, example, the return on a portfolio is considered to have a mean of 10% with standard deviation of 4%. Calculate the z score if the return is 12, 22 or 0%. So that's your starting point. What we need to do, just to get you going, I want you to have a go at this, but I just want you, first of all, to write on the slide the parallel scale. What you've got on the slide now is your Z scale. We need to get the X scale for the underlying, the underlying uh, distribution. So we're told the mean is 10%. So we can write on here X equals 10. If you want, put percentage to help us avoid confusion between X and Z. Now, can you just fill in the rest of X and see where we get to? So have, have a go at these questions. So please press pause now and have a go. Hopefully what you've done is you've said, well, one standard deviation is 4%. So Z equals one, X is gonna be 14%, and then 18% and 22%. Going downwards, 6%. That Z equals minus one. We're one standard deviation below the mean. We are one standard deviation four below the mean of 10, hence six. Two standard deviations below, we're at 2%. And then minus three is equivalent to minus two, where we are three, lots of four, less than 10. Uh, given that, now let's try the three questions. What is the Z score of 12%, 22%, and 0%? If you didn't have a go at that, if you didn't get that far, uh, please press pause and try that now before continuing. So with 12%, we're saying where is X equal to 12? Where X equals 10 is at Z equals zero x equals 14 um, is at z equals 1. So 12 is halfway in between. So here you've got 12%, and that's going to be basically question 1. 22% you can see, and 0 is going to be halfway between 2 and minus 2. And really those are our answers. So you may be able to see the z score of 12 is going to be halfway between z equals 0 and 1, so that's going to be half. Z score of 22, you can already see is three, and Z score of zero is halfway between minus two and minus three, so it's minus two and a half. But let's now just verify that using the formula. So X equals 12 percent gives us Z equals, well, think about the formula or think about common sense. It's 12, what is the, how, how big is Z? It's 12, how far is that above the mean? Well, we are, we are 12 minus 10, we are two above the mean. And how big is that in terms of standard deviations? So if a standard deviation, if a standard deviation is four, then two percentage points is half a standard deviation. And so that equals 0.5. So reasonably straightforward. Uh, and really this sort of question is fairly straightforward once you've understood how to manipulate Z and how to, to go to and from Z. Second one, we've got 22%. 
So this time z is going to be 22 minus 10 divided by 4. Can you see it's the same calculation in all cases? All we're doing is changing the x in this top right formula. Uh, and so here z equals 22 minus the mean of 10 divided by 4, and that gives us 3, which exactly ties in with what we've got up here. And then finally, 0%. Just because it's zero doesn't mean the answer is going to be zero. Zero we can see is down here, and we're looking at z of zero minus 10 divided by four. And not surprisingly, that's minus two and a half. And we can see on the diagram, we're halfway between minus two and minus three. So that's how we standardize a random variable. Um, hopefully a reasonably straightforward question should that come up. Now, let's have a look at the normal distribution and probabilities. We're looking at a cumulative distribution function, the CDF. And the way the tables work, if we use tables, is they are showing the CDF up to point Z. So here is an excerpt from the normal tables. You can find them in the back of your curriculum. Or you can, uh, if, if anyone's interested, you can create a spreadsheet quite easily. Um, uh, if anyone actually wants to contact Quoting, I'm very happy to, to, to send you the spreadsheet of this, but it's, it's really fairly straightforward. Uh, and so you've got the Z score, and it's giving you the CDF of those points. So for example, if Z equals zero, what is the CDF at zero? What is the probability that our normally our randomly a random variable, which is normally distributed, is to the left of zero? Answer, 0.5. And so you can see the 0.5 here. What else do we know? We know z equals 1.96. What's the CDF at 1.96? What's the probability that an, an n naught one an n naught one variable is less than plus 1.96? Think about it. Plus or minus 1.96 captures 95%. Therefore, the top tail is two and a half percent. So the chances are 97 and a half percent that we are less than 1.96. Let's see. Once so you can see the first decimal place and the whole numbers are down the left column. That defines which row we're on. And then the second decimal place is on the top row, which therefore defines the columns. So 1.9, we're on this row, 1.96, and you can see 0.975. In other words, 97.5% likelihood of being less than 1.96. What else do we know? Uh, what about z equals 1? So think about that. 0 to 1 is 34%, so minus infinity to 1 is 34 plus 50 equals 84%. 8413. We were close. Uh, what, how about 1.645? What do we expect that to be? Think carefully. Hopefully you're going to say 95%. The probability that we're less than 1.645 probability that we're less than 1.645 is 0 to 1.645. Remember, that's 45% plus the entire 50% to the left. Uh, 1.64 and 1.65, it's halfway between those two. And hopefully you can see that that is 0.95. So that's how we deal with this. There are other factors that we need to know. Um, other things that we can use for symmetry, and actually we've already gone through these, but let's formalize it and write it down. Probability that z is bigger than z equals 1 minus the probability that we're up to z. So let me just, let's just do as an example 1, so 0 0.8413. So what we're saying here is n of 1 equals 0.84. That's what this means. So you can see the notation in this box. N of Z is the cumulative distribution function at that point. So what that means, 1 minus, so probability Z is bigger than Z equals 1 minus N of Z. The probability that N is, that, that, that Z is bigger than 1, it's the top tail. Let's say Z is 1 here. Let's say this is 1. There's your 0 0.84, your 84%. And therefore the top bit must be 16%. So the probability that z is bigger than 1 is 1 minus the probability that it's smaller than 1, which is kind of obvious. So the probability to the left of 1 is 0.84. The probability to the right of 1 is 1 minus 0.84, which is 0.16. Uh, hopefully it's fairly simple. So z or probability z is bigger than 1.96. Remember, that's just the top 2.5% tail. And you can see that that works. That's plus 0.025, which is 1 minus 0.975.
Um, for negative numbers, we also use symmetry because the if you could take, for example, one, the area above one is 16%. The area below minus one is also 16%. So minus z, n of minus, so for a negative number minus z, n of minus, so basically z is positive here, so minus z is your negative number. n of minus z is 1 minus n of z. So for example, using 1, n of minus 1. So what's the area, uh, what's the area up to minus 1? Answer, you should immediately say, well, that's 16%. So the chances of being below minus 1 is 16%. And on the formula, it's 1 minus n of 1. So 1 minus 0.84, which is 0.16. In other words, the area below minus 1 is the same as the area above plus 1. Uh, another example, n of minus 1.96. What's this bottom tail down here? Uh, you should know from the previous discussion, it's 2.5%, uh, but it's 1 minus n of 1.96. So n of 1.96 is 0.975. 1 minus that is 0.025. There's your 2.5% left-hand tail. That's how we deal with this. Please do go through those. Do check they make sense. But in all honesty, a bit of common sense, understanding that the area under the PDF is exactly 1, using a bit of symmetry, you can get to most of these answers without learning the algebra. Let's try one more example here. Um, Joshua Rosen is manager of the Balagan Balanced Fund, um, BBF, which has distributions of returns that are approximately normal. Um, it has been observed that the mean return is 12%, standard deviation 6%. Calculate, without tables, the probability that BBF returns more than 18% or BBF returns a loss. Have a go at that and come back when you've tried it. What we should do is first of all overlay this diagram with the x variable. So here is the return that Joshua Rosen achieves. The mean is 12%, so 12%. Standard deviation is 6%, so this is 18%. This is 24%. This is 30%. It's pretty good. Uh, going downwards, subtract 6 each time, 6%, 0, minus 6%. So probability, question 1, uh, returns more than 18%. So we want the top area above 1. So it's probability that z is greater than 1, and you should see that's a tail of 16%. It's exactly what we've just done. So probability z is bigger than 1 is 1 minus n of 1 if you remember the algebra, uh, and 1 minus 0.84 is 0.16. Now, we don't need the tables for that. You should know that between 0 and 1 is 0.34, between 0 and infinity is 0.5, therefore between 1 and infinity is 0.16. Question 2. BBF returns a loss. Well, here's our loss. So z equals minus 2. What's the area? So BBF returns a loss. This is the probability that z is less than minus 2. The probability that z is less than minus 2, which is again one of the ones we should know, it's the bottom tail, and in this case it's 0 0.025. Using tables, pz is less than minus 2 is the same as z being bigger than 2, and 2.5% 2 .2 approximately, because we know in fact that's an, an accurate number with 1.96, 2 is a close enough approximation. So hopefully you got both of those right. That's section four. We have one further section to wrap this reading up.